Our gospel reading this morning is from the second verse of the book of John. First, remembering the often told story of Jesus' first miracle. He was at a wedding reception, and the disciples and his mother were with him. There must have been a huge crowd or a lot of heavy drinkers because the awful, unforgivable thing happened, that of running out of wine before the end of the celebration. For his first miracle, Jesus filled the jars with water and then turned the water into wine. To help clarify things in this story, since terminology and description words change over time in the story. The master of the banquet would be today the caterer of the wedding reception. And the groom must have been covering the cost because he went to the master of the banquet, to, uh, the master of the banquet went to the groom with the news of the special wine. We can almost see him winking at the groom in their conversation. John 2, 7 through 11. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tested the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He then called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best to last. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. God's holy words in the house of the Lord. So miracles are our subject today. From beginning to end, the Bible is full of many stories and many miracles too. As you listen and follow this, be thinking about this question. What do miracles do? Our Old Testament reading was probably familiar from Sunday school or even from the movie versions of Moses and his brother Aaron freeing the Israelites. But it's so very important to hear again related to miracles. God's patience had been long-suffering. The time had come for his plan to free the captive Israelites who went to Egypt during a famine and wound up being made into slaves. The plan was for Moses and his brother to convince this particular Pharaoh to release all of the Israelites. Pharaoh needed a lot of prompting to let them go. It could have gone easier for him and his people, but he stubbornly refused to believe the message, the order, came from God Almighty. And so all of those awful plagues happened. Pharaoh's own magician, magicians, who could perform magic themselves, they believed God. In fear and trembling, they told Pharaoh in Exodus 8.19, that those miracles were from the very finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart stayed hard. Did you hear or catch in the Bible reading, Exodus 7, 3, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Did you always wonder 
as I did why God would do that? Allow me to explain how I've rationalized that. Through my many years of research and study, I've found nothing about it. Perhaps it's that God knew this king's heart and mind so well, as he knows all of ours so well. Knowing Pharaoh knew, God knew, he would not believe Moses and Aaron about anything being from their God. And maybe our God knew a small miracle would only soften the Pharaoh's heart a little bit, enough that he would only be willing to let some of the Israelites go. But that wasn't God's plan. His plan was for letting all of the captive slaves go free. God would know things had to get bad enough, intense enough, to have Pharaoh believe that all of the plagues were really from God. Bending the rigid Pharaohs to finally agree to let all of God's people go. Some of God's miracles happen quickly. God is God. He can do that. But typically for his big plans, there's strategy. A lot of things have to be in place, and they can take time. Many years earlier, you may remember another Bible story, this time about the reigning Pharaoh's daughter, who found a protected basket hidden in the water with the baby in it, and how she saved the baby and kept him and his mother. She raised that baby as a prince. He spent the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's palace. That baby grew up to be old man Moses. With that background, who better than Moses to accomplish God's plan many years later? The infant Moses had been hidden in the basket years earlier to protect him because the Pharaoh heard rumors about that baby Jesus. He ordered all infant boys killed to be sure he got the right baby, the Jews' baby Jesus. Moses' brother Aaron was three years older, and so he was spared. He grew up well-spoken and was able to speak for his brother Moses in God's plan. There are sometimes delays in God's timing. Do you see that it took a lot of years for everything to line up? Awesome. God is an awesome God, isn't he? And remember John's Gospel? reading about the Jesus' first miracle, water. Appropriate. Yes. About Jesus' changing the water into wine. When the time was right. And do you remember the final line in that verse? and his disciples believed in him. That's it. That's the answer to the question I asked you earlier. What do miracles do? They help us see God's power and glory. And then like the disciples, we see and then truly believe knowing we can put our trust in Jesus, in our Father God. Here's another question. Are there modern day miracles? Miracles now, today, for us? You've no doubt heard people proclaim miracles in their lives 
or maybe recognize them in your own. Little ones, sometimes big ones. I've heard about unmistakable miracles, and I certainly have had them in my own life. Sometimes they can be hard to see among the turmoil. Some people have problems believing miracles, maybe because they believe that miracles contain only good things. But sometimes bad stuff happens to get to the miracle. The bad stuff isn't God. It's because of the ever-present evil that's still in the world. But God is on our side. Sometimes the going can get rough, as in the story of Moses and the Israelites. But God is known for making great and good things come out of some pretty evil circumstances. It is so important to stay close to God so that we learn to recognize his good from the evil. Those evil parts are what make people doubt God's mercy. But he is there working. He takes the bad stuff from the evil of the world and works to bring truth, justice, and even judgment. And sometimes, hard to wonder why there are countless stories in the Bible and in our lives today of good, faithful, believing Christians that have had a tragedy and then a miracle and then back to other trying times. And we ask, why? It's because God's provisions are on an as-needed basis. We must depend on him as we face each new trial. One miracle cannot solve everything. Some people have had such bad things happen that, if you know what I mean, it's a good thing we don't end up looking like what we've been through. Yikes. But when we get through it, and we dust ourselves off, and we straighten our hair, we realize God was in it, there with us. When we look back carefully and piece things together, we can see even small bits of heavenly, divine, loving intervention that was in the story or in the tragedy. Proof that God was in it. We've said, wow, I don't believe that, or I can't believe that. Why do we say that? Have you looked back at something and seen that it could only have been a miracle? So the answer to our second question is, yes, there are modern miracles, and even tiny daily miracles. But did you cast them off as circumstance, coincidence, woulda, coulda happened anyway? Or was it a God wink? Have you heard about the series of books about God winks? The author, Squire Rushnell, shares countless true, real stories people have shared with him. He coined the word God winks to help us recognize miracles in our everyday lives. In his words, he writes, one of the things I like the most about Godwinks is that they are tangible signposts from God, making his presence known in our lives every single day. He says if you want to be certain that God has been in your life all along, take the time not only to reflect back on things, 
that happened, but watch for those little daily miracles. He tells us you will see winks from God that you didn't notice before. God winks, our God winking at us. Those God winks in my life are a very big part of my faith. I've seen and felt his love. I've seen and felt his plans at work. And I've felt his amazing assurances in daily little things. And sometimes I chuckle at God winks. Wrapping up with this, in Norman Vincent Peale's little booklet, Expect a Miracle, Peel says, doubt always gets in the way of faith. Well, doubt always gets in the way of miracles too. So believe and ask God for a miracle and keep asking. We're allowed to do that. We're told to ask for what we need. Ask, watch, and wait and be sure to thank him. Don't be anxious for your own timing. Try to sense and feel God's strategy. With patience and trust, you will see and feel the Holy Spirit surrounding you with love, hope, help, and sometimes a wink to reassure you. Ending with this. When we are open to God's love and guidance and we keep working on knowing God's character and if we are not stubbornly independent, we will see miracles. As we recognize his help, we will follow changes in our lives more willingly. We will focus on the details and not on the end results that are his. Every day his plans are unfolding in our lives, this world, in our politics, and in our churches. Keep watching. God's working on things. Amen.